Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Again, for those um, who are here at the beginning, my name is Simon Turpin. I'm the Executive Director of Answers and Genesis in the UK. I'm just trying to share this live on Facebook so Josh can share it to uh, his friends. But we're going to be having a webinar tonight on the subject of preaching Christ in a pagan culture. And with me is Pastor Josh Williamson um, from Newquay Baptist Church. And I'm going to get this right this time in Cornwall, not Devon. Correct. Yeah. So, so Josh is actually from this, lives in the south of England, but he, he's actually from way further south than that, as you'll recognize by his accent. Um, I'm sure Josh will tell you about why he's here in the UK um, at the beginning of his talk, but it's great to have you with us, Josh. Thank you very much for having me tonight. And just so you know, everyone, um, Josh will be presenting on preaching Christ in the pagan culture. And Josh has a, has a, has a great background as an, evangelist, as an evangelist of preaching Christ in the open air. So he's a lot of experience in this. And if you have questions that come up during his talk, then please put them in uh, the Q&A section. And we'll try and get to them at the end and have a little Q&A um, with Josh. But I'm going to now hand over to Josh. And Josh, if you want to just give a brief introduction to yourself, then start the talk. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight as we look at an important topic. Uh, when it comes to evangelism, that's my passion. Uh, it's what uh, gets me excited. I, I love to be able to share the good news of Jesus. I want people to come to know and love Christ. Now, obviously, our culture is quite different uh, today than what it was, say, 50 years ago or even 20 years ago. So tonight we're going to look at how to evangelize a pagan culture. Uh, now, just a little bit about me before we get underway. As has been mentioned, my accent gives it away that I'm not from here. I'm from Australia, uh, but I was sent across to the UK by my home church in Brisbane to serve as a missionary here in Cornwall. And by God's grace, we are seeing the church grow here in Cornwall. I'm at New Key Baptist Church. We're seeing people come to love Jesus. We're seeing the gospel advance and Christ is doing many wonderful things. And for that, we are very, very thankful. So that's probably all you really need to know about me. Uh, if you want to find out more about who I am, feel free to message me or to get in touch via my website, joshwilliamson.org. And I'll be more than happy to uh, share with you what, or try and answer whatever question you may have. And if it's okay with Simon, I'm going to share my screen and get underway. Are we all good to start, Simon? Yeah, you're good to go, mate. Great. Well, you're going to have to bear with me. I, I've, I've preached in different venues from large evangelistic meetings to one or two people in a chapel, but this is the first time I've preached via Zoom. So I'm going to need uh, the grace of God's people here if I make any mistakes as I uh, present on this electronic means. So let's uh, commit our time to the Lord in prayer before we get into looking at preaching Christ in a pagan culture. Let's pray. Oh, our God and our Father, we do thank you for the gift of technology, that, Lord, we are able to gather tonight from various locations in various contexts to study your word and to learn how we may be more effective in our gospel ministry. Lord, tonight we do pray to you, the Lord of the harvest, that you would raise up laborers to go forth into your harvest field and that we would see a harvest of souls. Lord, as we look around us, as we look at our culture, we see a society that has forsaken the truth. But Father, we know that you are the missionary God. You are the God who seeks and saves the lost. So tonight we ask that you would use us in some way to reach people for your kingdom and for your great namesake. Lord, please be with me as I speak tonight. May I know the liberty of the spirit and may I be faithful to teach your word. We pray these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, tonight we're looking at preaching Christ in a pagan culture, and it kind of goes without saying that we live in a day and age where our society has decided to cast off Christianity. Uh, for the past 2,000 years, the West has been blessed with some form of gospel ministry. Uh, for 2,000 years, our ancestors, our forefathers have had access to the good news of salvation. And as a result of that great blessing that God has given to us, uh, Western civilization 
was originally built upon a very strong Christian foundation. As we look at our society historically, we see that our legal system, our parliament, how we conduct ourselves in social interaction, how our society is structured is all based upon a Christian worldview. But today we're starting to see that change. Uh, today we're seeing that as a nation, we are no longer building upon the foundation of God's word. Rather, we are building upon the shifting sands of man's opinion. As a culture, as a nation, we are casting off that which made the West great. Great. We are casting off Christianity. And due to this, we are actually seeing a decline of Christian thought and Christian understanding throughout the Western world, including here in the UK. And just to illustrate that, I want to share with you a news article that was from a few years ago. It was a survey conducted here in England about what are the most offensive, what are the most foul words that people know. Now, they're not the sort of surveys you normally read, but it was interesting that in this survey, uh, students, young people, children were asked, what's the worst word you can think of? Now, they looked at all the different swear words, all the different cursing, and, and all the different foul forms of speech. But what was interesting is that this survey found that 68% of all children believed that the name Jesus Christ only had negative connotations. 68% of children believed that Jesus was a bad word. See, what we're seeing is that our culture and our society is becoming less Christian every day. Uh, we no longer live in a culture where Christianity has the influence that it once enjoyed. Uh, everything has certainly changed. And as I think about our culture, as I think about our society, I find myself thinking about Romans chapter 15, and in particular, verse 20. Now, in that verse, the Apostle Paul is speaking, and he says these wonderful words. He says in Romans 15, 20, And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. Now, when Paul wrote these words in the epistle to the Romans, he was actually planning a missions trip westward into Europe to a place that had never received the gospel. Now, we would say that is Spain. And his plan was to take the gospel to a people that had never heard of Jesus. He wanted to do pioneer missions. Now, today, those who study missions, those who promote the cause of world evangelization, will take this verse and they will say, this verse speaks to the two billion people that are still unreached with the gospel in our world tonight. And indeed, it is terrible to know there are still two billion people the world over who are yet to hear the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But increasingly, I think this verse can actually be applied to our communities and to our context. As in our Western nations today, we are living in a society that has no foundation, a society that has no basis or understanding of Christianity. There is a sense where the West, and particularly here in the UK, where our society is reached in the sense that it has access to gospel material, but it's unreached in the sense that they don't know how to access that gospel material, nor do people understand what it means. As a result, today we are seeing a generation grow up that has no foundation in Christianity. And as that generation comes into play, we find that our society loses the foundation of Christ that it has built upon for 2,000 years. You see, what we are seeing today is that we are no longer building upon a Christian foundation. We are no longer building upon the basis of God's word. Rather, we are trying to build our society upon the shifting sands of man's opinion. We are trying to build our culture on secularism or secular humanism. And this means that the West needs missionaries. When I was sent from Australia to serve in the UK as a missionary, I was told by godly men who were in the mission field in the 1040 window that I wasn't a real missionary because I'm going to a culture and a society that already has the gospel. But for those people to say that actually betrays that they don't understand just how bad things have become in Western nations. You see, in the West, we need missionaries. We need gospel men 
to carry the truth of God's word to a people who are now both unreached and reached. Reached in the sense they have the Bible, but unreached in the sense that they don't understand it. The Lord Jesus tells us in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, in the Great Commission, that we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That means we need to evangelize even here in our Western nations. We need to evangelize in the UK. We must be gospel people to a pagan culture. We must proclaim Christ to a society that has cast him off. But as we think about evangelism, one of the biggest problems we face in our evangelistic strategies is that so often we build our evangelism programs, our evangelism methods and strategies upon the assumption that our culture, that our community actually understands what we're talking about. We operate with an assumption that the non-Christian in our culture still has a Christian worldview. We assume that they're still building upon a Christian foundation, but that certainly isn't the case anymore. Uh, it's no exaggeration to say that in my library, I have uh, a number of books on evangelism and apologetics. And sadly, a common error amongst many of them is that they all assume that we have a Christian foundation and basis in the West that we're still building upon. But the reality is quite different. I mean, our current generation and future generations following on do not speak the same spiritual language that we speak. They come from a different foundation. They're building upon a different worldview. And if we're going to effectively communicate the gospel to them, then we need to understand what their foundations are. We need to understand where they are coming from so that we can better minister to them. So when it comes to evangelism, I would suggest to you that we need to realize that there's actually two types of people in the world. And the two types of people I would point us to is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, when the Apostle Paul says, but we preach Christ crucified to the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. Now, Paul was talking about his context of ministry. He had Jews that he was ministering to who considered the gospel fool, a stumbling block. They considered the message of Jesus something they could not accept. But then he also had the Greeks who considered the message of the gospel foolish. Now, today, we have the same types of people. We have Jews and Greeks in our society. Jews and Greeks have a different foundation. They speak different languages. Now, historically, in the West, we were more Jewish in our understanding. That is, we had a biblical worldview. But today, we're actually more Greek in the way we think and the way we act. But the big problem is when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to sharing the good news into our pagan culture, is that much of the church still tries to evangelize as if our culture had not changed. They still try to evangelize as if our society is still Jewish in its thinking. And if we persist in making those kinds of assumptions, uh, then we will not impact our culture. So what I want to propose tonight is something radical, a radical idea for revolution, a, a radical idea for evangelizing our culture. Uh, let me give you something that is, is, is so shocking that people may be caught off guard by it. Here's what I think we should do when it comes to evangelizing a pagan culture. I think we should start our evangelism by going back to the beginning. We need to go back to the start and build our gospel message upon the foundation of God's word, starting in the book of Genesis. Uh, let me illustrate this. I love the Who Done It movies. You may have seen those sort of murder mysteries, those crime movies, where you start watching a film, and at the right at the start of the movie, a crime takes place, and then for the next two hours, there's all these twists and turns and ups and downs where you're trying to work out who the criminal is. Now, part of the enjoyment of those films is watching all the way through and making guesses about what's going to happen. Something you never do when you watch a whodunit film is fast forward to the end, find out who the criminal is, and then ignore the rest of the story. Yet that is exactly what we do in modern evangelism. Uh, that is what we are now doing in our pagan culture. 
we seek to fast forward to the end to the gospel, to the good news that Jesus has died and risen again and proclaim that message to our society, a message we should be proclaiming, but we ignore all that went before. We don't build upon the foundation. You see, if we look through the Old Testament, we see the Old Testament constantly points and builds to Jesus. It, it provides the foundations that are needed for people to understand the gospel. You see, if we're going to explain the gospel, that is the good news, if we're going to proclaim that Jesus has come into the world to save sinners, that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of his people, that he took the punishment they deserved, that he was crucified, dead and buried, but then rose on the third day, then what we need to do is explain first and foremost, why? Why did Jesus have to do that? Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? And for us to proclaim the why message, we have to step back and establish a foundation. We have to step back to the beginning and explain that the good news is only good because of the bad news that first came. If people are going to understand why we need Jesus, if people are going to understand why the cross is necessary, they have to have a foundation that explains why Jesus had to come. And the only way we can explain that culture. If we want a pagan culture, a pagan society to embrace the truth of the gospel, then we need to start with the fundamental truth of who God is and what God has done. And if we ignore those fundamental truths, if we ignore the foundations that are found in the book of Genesis, then it would be like us trying to build a house starting with the roof and the walls. It just won't work. You see, if we were to break down the gospel and look at the gospel building blocks, the fundamentals of the gospel, it all starts with a declaration of who God is. There is a God who is good and he is the creator. He is the God who rules and reigns over all things. And as such, he gets to set the rules. But we chose to rebel against that God. That's our starting point when it comes to the gospel. We must talk about the God who made us and then also the fact that we rebelled against God. This is foundational knowledge that is needed in evangelizing a pagan culture. But then we also move on to explain Jesus, God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, the one who was crucified for the sins of his people and then rose again from the dead. That's the power of the gospel. We must proclaim that. Once we proclaim the foundational knowledge, the power of the gospel, we then move on to the hope. We explain the hope of the gospel. The hope that says because Jesus has died and risen again, he is completely victorious and the curse of sin has been defeated. Now, all these points work together. The foundation, the power and the hope. This is what helps us evangelize a culture that has no understanding of who God is and what he has done. But today, most of our evangelism ignores the foundation because we assume the foundation is in place. What we find in, with most evangelistic methods and strategies or church outreach programs is that we focus on the power and the hope. And the reason we do that is because we are still operating in the mindset that our culture has not changed. And there is the major issue when it comes to reaching our culture. We are speaking a different language because our culture has a different foundation and a different basis that they build from. But there is still hope in the midst of all this, even though our culture has changed, even though our society no longer is Jewish in its thinking. God knew that this was going to happen. But we serve a sovereign God who knows the end from the beginning. We serve a God who knows everything about everything. And that sovereign God has given us patterns on how we should evangelize and how we should reach our culture. God has given us his word. And this is why the Bible is so important when it comes to evangelism. We should test all our evangelistic methods according to the word of God. And as we look at the Bible, we see that God actually shows us how to evangelize a Jewish culture, that is a culture that has a biblical understanding, but it also shows us how we can evangelize a pagan culture, a culture that has no biblical understanding. And in the time that we have together, I want us to look 
at two sermons, two types of evangelism. And to do that, we're going to look at Acts chapter 2 and also Acts chapter 17. Now, this is not going to be an in-depth expositional sermon of both of those passages, so you don't have to worry that we're going to be here for a few hours. But we're not going to do that. We're going to move relatively quickly and try and focus upon the big picture. First, we're going to look at Acts chapter 2, where the Apostle Peter is preaching to a Jewish audience. And then we'll look at Acts chapter 17, where the Apostle Paul preaches to a pagan and Greek audience. When you see Acts chapter 2, I want you to think that is what the West was like generations ago. But when you look at Acts chapter 17, think that that is the generation and our culture that we see today. So let's start with Acts chapter 2. Now in Acts chapter 2, uh, we see the Apostle Peter standing up and proclaiming a bold message. I want you to, to picture the scene. Uh, the book of Acts tells us that Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost, a day where there was Jews from all different parts of the world gathered together. And in Acts chapter 2, Peter is empowered by the Holy Spirit to preach the truth. And in verse 22 and verse 23 of Acts 2, we see that Peter stands up and he preaches a confrontational message. He preaches a message that says to the Jewish audience, you are guilty of crucifying your Messiah. Then in verse 24, he says, you may have killed him, but death could not hold him down. Jesus is risen from the dead. In verse 37 and 38, the Jewish audience that have heard this confrontational message of Jesus crucified and risen again, respond by saying, what shall we do? How do we respond to this message of the gospel? And the apostle Peter tells them, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Uh, Peter says, turn from your sins and trust in the Savior. But how did the people respond? Well, verse 41 tells us what the Jews did. 3,000 of them responded. 3,000 people heard the good news of salvation and they trusted in Jesus. Now, wouldn't that be wonderful to see in our country today? Wouldn't it be wonderful that we could hold those sort of gospel meetings where 3,000 people are converted in a moment? Now, we used to see that in this country. Indeed, we used to see that throughout the Western world. There were times when there were large evangelistic meetings and thousands of people would profess faith in the Lord Jesus. But that isn't common today. Uh, I, I've personally been involved in evangelistic ministry now since 2003. And in that time, I've worked with evangelists who have preached large crusade-based meetings. I have been involved in preaching to large meetings myself. But something I have never seen in those large meetings is 3,000 people soundly saved on one day. It, it just doesn't happen like that. And the question I have to ask is why? Now, why aren't we seeing these kinds of numbers? And I think the answer is found by examining who Peter was talking to. So who is Peter preaching to in Acts chapter 2? Well, he's preaching to the Jews. He's preaching to people who knew the scripture. They had a foundational knowledge. They were convinced that there was a creator God. They knew about sin and death. They had a sacrificial system in place. They even had a high view of God's word. The Jews had a foundational knowledge, but for them, the stumbling block was the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. That's why 1 Corinthians 1.23 says that Christ crucified is a stumbling block to the Jews. See, what we need to realize is that the Jews were a creation-based culture. They had a foundation in Scripture. They understood Genesis. They understood God, sin, and death. They understood that our society was corrupted because of sin. They even knew about the need of sacrifice and the fact that God would provide a rescuer. They had a biblical worldview. The stumbling block for the Jewish people was the Messiah being crucified. They did not like the idea of Jesus dying and rising again. That was their stumbling block. But here's the point. Peter could stand up and preach to them on the day of Pentecost and he didn't have to define his terms as they already spoke the same language he did. They understood what he was saying 
since they were building upon biblical foundations. When Peter said God, they would have thought immediately of the God of the scripture. And generations ago in our culture here in the UK, if you went out into our community and said God, most people would have heard it just like the Jews did in Acts chapter 2. They would have thought of the God of the Bible. But today, when you say God, people will respond by saying, which one? What God are you talking about? You see, in a pagan culture, they believe there are many gods. So when you say God in our culture today, they'll say, what one are you talking about? Are you talking about the Muslim God or the Hindu gods? Are you talking about the God of naturalism? Are you talking about the God of secularism? What God are you talking about? I see, most people in our society today don't think about the God of the Bible because our secular pagan culture has done a great job in trying to remove him from our thinking. So when we say God in our evangelism, the question we have to ask ourselves is what are people hearing? What are they understanding by our words? I mean, they're not hearing the same thing we are hearing. They're not understanding the term the same way we hear the term and understand it. Generations ago, we could have done that. We could assume knowledge. But today we have a different generation, a different culture that is built upon a different foundation. The Jews had a good starting point. They had the revelation of God. They had the Bible. They knew of creation. They knew of the fall of man. They knew of Adam and Eve. They knew about death being a result of sin. But their stumbling block was the cross. So that is where all the gospel proclamation focused upon. Peter could proclaim the cross to them and he could preach Jesus to them because they had foundations. That's how the West used to be. And that is why evangelists in this country and indeed throughout the Western world used to be able to simply stand up and proclaim Jesus died for sinners and thousands of people were converted. The UK back then was an Acts 2 culture. And even those who didn't attend church had a biblical worldview. They had a biblical foundation. They understood the language of the Bible, and that made it a lot easier to preach the gospel. Britain and the, the, and the Western world as a whole was an Acts 2 society. But today we are Acts 17. We are pagan in our understanding. And, and sadly, what has happened is that many churches have actually missed this cultural change. But the world hasn't missed it. The world knows that things have moved on and Christianity has been pushed into the past. For instance, in the Free Inquiry magazine, it says, a historic transition is occurring, barely noticed, slowly, quietly, imperceptibly. Religion, that is Christianity, is shriveling in America as it already has in Europe, Canada, Australia, across the developed world. Increasingly, supernatural faith belongs to the third world. The first world is entering the long predicted secular age where science and knowledge dominate. Uh, let, me, let me translate for you. The Western world used to be Acts 2, but now it is Acts 17. It used to be like the Jews, but now it is like the Greek. Our culture no longer believes in the one God. We are now a culture that believes in many gods. We've embraced paganism. We are no longer a culture that builds our thinking upon God's word. Instead, we build our society upon man's word. See, these changes mean that as a society, we have moved away from the moral absolutes of scripture to a moral relativism where each person does what is right in their own eyes. And leading the charge in this whole change has been the debate over homosexuality and same-sex marriage. The moment you can say marriage can be between two men or two women, then it shows there are no moral absolutes. It shows that society has moved away from a biblical foundation. And Romans chapter 1 tells us that when a society is under God's judgment, then we see these kinds of changes. We see men lusting for men. We see women lusting after women. And that is what we're seeing in our culture, which according to the scripture is a sign that God's judgment is upon our nation. 
It's a sign that we are a pagan society and God is judging us. So the Western world as a whole is under the judgment of God. We have cast off Christianity. We have turned our back on our creator. And now the wrath of God is revealed against the West. Now, some of the reasons that our culture and our society is under the judgment of God is because we have removed the scripture from being taught. People no longer cherish or believe the word of God. Abortion, the murder of babies is now a major issue in our land. Millions are being slaughtered in the name of choice each year in the West. Do we really think God is going to sit idly by and allow our nations to do this? Well, no, God's going to judge the nations, which is the pagan nations of the world. At my home church at New Key Baptist, I'm actually preaching through the book of Nahum at the moment. And it's interesting to study in Nahum chapter one, where God puts a prophecy against the city of Nineveh. And it's interesting that Nineveh, under the preaching of Jonah, was converted. But a hundred years later, they had forsaken the gospel, they'd forsaken the truth, and God, as a result, said, I'm going to judge you, I'm going to wipe you out. They had gone back to paganism. And God says, because of that, judgment will come. After a hundred years, God brought judgment. We in the West have turned our back after 2,000 years. We have gone to paganism after so many years of following biblical worldview. Surely we have to realize that God's judgment is going to come upon us. Our culture and our society has changed. But what is interesting is that in Nahum, even in the midst of judgment, God still shows grace. And he still says he's slow to anger. And we're still in a day of grace here in the West. God still extends his hand of mercy to sinners in our day and age. And he calls on them to repent and trust in the Savior. But how do we reach them? How do we reach our society? See, the church for too long has been silent on the cultural change and the creeping sin. We've been silent and sat back, and in some cases, we have compromised and sin, but God's not going to tolerate that. We need to evangelize. We need to reach our culture. Newsweek understands our culture and our society when it says we live in a society where the one God has died, and we've now got the birth of many gods. We've embraced an Acts 17 pagan society. You see, in Acts 17, when the Apostle Paul stood up to preach, he was preaching into a culture and a society that was much like ours. And that's the context Paul finds himself in in Acts chapter 17. But what is interesting is that Paul changes his evangelistic tactics in that one chapter. In Acts chapter 17, Paul starts off his evangelism in verse 16 and 18 by preaching an Acts 2 model. He preaches Jesus and the resurrection without proclaiming foundational truth. In Acts 17, uh, verses 18, we see that Paul preaches the gospel, he preaches Jesus and the resurrection, and the Greek audience don't understand what he's talking about. They are confused. They think he is babbling. In fact, some thought Paul was talking about two different gods, Jesus and the resurrection. And as a result, they conclude what Paul said was foolish. They believed his message was foolish because they didn't have a foundation. You see, the Greeks, unlike the Jews, were building upon an unbiblical foundation. They had an unbiblical worldview. They were much like us in that they had no concept of a creator. They didn't believe in the historical Adam and Eve. They didn't believe in the fall of man. They didn't believe in the entrance of sin or a sacrificial system. They did not have a biblical foundation. So when they heard the message of Jesus crucified and risen again, they had no understanding. You see, what the Greeks had was actually an evolutionary-based worldview. They believed that life arose from the dirt and that even the gods evolved. Now, you see, Charlie Darwin did not invent evolution. He merely popularized a particular view of evolution. Whenever a culture rejects the truth of a creator God, you can be sure that some form of evolutionary view will follow. The pagans love evolution as evolution is a pagan naturalistic religion that says life arises merely from nature. They try to explain life away 
without God. And that's what the Greeks did. That's what the pagans do. That's what our society does. See, the Greeks didn't understand the creator God. They didn't understand the fall. They didn't understand Adam and Eve. They had no foundational knowledge. And as a result, the preaching of the cross was foolishness to them. See, an evolutionary-based culture like ours will never understand the language we preach if they don't have the right foundation. When you say God to them, they'll say, which God? And I saw this illustrated perfectly in my own evangelistic ministry a few years ago when I was conducting an open-air meeting in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, during this one Saturday night gospel meeting, the Lord was blessing the preaching. The crowd had gathered as a good-sized crowd. And I was proclaiming the gospel. And I was talking about how God had done certain things. And as I said that, the thought crossed my mind, do these people understand who God is? So I paused my message and I said to the crowd, when I say God, what do you hear? What do you understand me as saying? One man in the crowd cried out, I'm thinking of Buddha. Another man yelled out, I think Allah. Someone said, I'm thinking nothing. And finally, one man said, I'm thinking Jesus. You see, what that illustrated to me was that even though we all spoke English, even though we all spoke the same language, we had different understandings. What I needed to do was define to the crowd who God is. I had to explain to them that God is the creator and he is separate from his creation. I had to explain that he is the one who made all things. There was a need for me to start at the beginning to effectively evangelize our pagan culture. You see, if we try to proclaim the gospel without a foundation, then we're trying to build a roof of Christianity without the foundation stone in place. It won't work. It won't last. What we need to do is step back and we need to start at the beginning. We need to lay the foundations again. We can no longer assume that there's foundational knowledge in our culture and in our society. I mean, I want you to think about it for a moment. If you spoke to a Jewish mindset person, they would understand God's sin, death, and Savior. Although they may understand it, they might not agree with it, but they would understand it. But if you said that to a Greek thinker, they would have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, for instance, if you were to speak to people in our society, we we see one of the biggest questions that comes up is the question of why would God create a world with And the reason our society is so big on asking that question is because we live in a society that's dominated by the pagan view of evolution. In evolution, they teach that death has always been. There's been millions of years of death. Life arises as a result of all this chaos and death. The system of millions of years says there has to be suffering and it has to produce life. So when you talk about God, they go, well, why would your God make a system like that? Why would your God, if he is loving, make a world that is full of death and suffering and pain? See, what they need to realize is that death and suffering hasn't always been here. Rather, death and suffering is a consequence of sin. When people hear you talk about the loving God, when people hear you talk about God loving them, they will hear you through the framework of their evolutionary mindset. They will hear you through millions of years of death and suffering and pain. And as a result, they'll conclude that your God's not loving. Rather, he is wicked and evil. See, what we have to do is step back and explain that our God is good. And he made a very good world, a world that had no death and that had no suffering. And into that good world, God made humanity, made special, made in his image. Therefore, we have value and worth. But mankind rebelled against God. And through that act of rebellion, sin and death came into the world. See, we need to step back and explain that the reason there's suffering in the world is because Adam and Eve rebelled against God. God did not make a world that relies on death and suffering to make everything. But rather, death is a result of sin. Explain to people that we have corrupted God's good world, that the world is evil because ultimately we are evil because we've all sinned against God. And that is why we need the Savior. 
We need the Lord Jesus to come and die on the cross for sinners and to rise again from the dead. We need the Savior who calls on us to repent and trust in him. You see, in the Greek thinking mindset, they had no place for the Savior because they had no starting point. And when you compare the Jews and the Greeks in Scripture, you are ultimately comparing Western culture from generations ago with today. You see, the Greeks, the West today, are on a whole different road. We have two roads, we have two religions, we have two different starting points. Uh, starting with man's word, you see that there is a completely different religion, a completely different world that our, our worldview that our society is building upon. The Greek mindset, the mindset that said there is no creator God, does not lead to the cross. So if we want to reach our pagan culture, if we want to reach our society, if we want to preach Christ in this community, then what we need to do is take people off the road that they are currently on, and we need to take them back to the start of the right road. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul does in Acts chapter 17. He puts the Greeks on the right road. When Paul went up Mars Hill, he saw that the Greeks were pagan in their understanding. And as he stood on Mars Hill, he began to preach to them. But first he noticed that they had all these different idols and they saw a altar to an unknown God. But Paul grabs a hold of that illustration. And in verse 24 and 25 says, let me tell you about that God. That God is the creator. God doesn't need anything or anyone. He starts by laying the foundation. Who is God? God is the creator. Then in verse 26, Paul says, this creator God made all of humanity from one blood. That is, he made him from one man. He made him from Adam. See, what Paul is doing is taking the Greeks, a pagan culture, back to the beginning. He, he's taking them back to the start of the right road. He's taking them back to Genesis. And he lays the foundations. He says, here is the creator God who doesn't need us. Here is the creator God who made all things, who made all of humanity. He's not like us. And he explains that we've rebelled against that God. He talks about this, who the creator is. And by doing so, he reveals sin and he reveals the coming Messiah. You see, for Paul here in Acts chapter 17, when he's evangelizing a pagan culture, he takes the Greeks' worldview and he takes it back to the beginning. And then in verse 30 and 31, after he has put them on the right road, he then proclaims the death and resurrection of Christ. And he calls on people to repent, to trust in the one who made them, to turn from their sins and trust in God. But how do the people respond? Well, verse 32 and 34 tells us how they respond. The first time Paul preached in Athens, the people said it was foolishness. They thought he was babbling. But this time we see people understand. And people believed. And people wanted to learn more. This is successful evangelism in a pagan culture. What Paul did was turn Greeks into Jews. Pagans were converted. And over time, we see that the church was established in that city and it began to grow. Greeks were turned into Jews. Their foundation and their worldview was completely changed. And if we're going to reach our society, if we're going to evangelize our culture, our pagan culture, then we have to be about the business of turning Greeks into Jews. We have to lay the foundation again. Now, let me just stress, if we are going to engage in this kind of evangelism, we need to be in it for the long haul. It's not going to be a quick process. Uh, we may see people saved instantly, but oftentimes we need to build slowly. It takes time to change a mindset. It takes time to undo all the errors that people have been indoctrinated to and put them on the right road. You see, we wouldn't expect someone moving to the UK to instantly settle into our culture, speak our language and have our same sense of humor. They would say, no, that takes time to develop. Likewise, turning Greeks into Jews will take time. So we must patiently and lovingly proclaim Christ, building upon a good foundation beginning in the very first book of the Bible, starting in Genesis. You see, in the West, we used to be like Jews. But as we've moved away from our foundations, we have become like the Greeks. 
And today we are just seeing more and more distance put between us and the world. There is now a great gulf, a generational gulf between believers and non-believers. We have two different worldviews. We have two different languages. We're on two different paths. There is a massive difference between the Jews in thinking and the Greeks in thinking. Our society no longer has a Christian worldview. We now have a completely secular worldview. And as a result, our Greek thinkers today look upon us and look upon the church. What a load of rubbish. They think what we preach is foolishness. And the reason they think that is because they have a completely different foundation. They have a completely different starting point. You see, our generation today is completely Greek in their thinking. When they engage in politics, when they engage in business, when they go about their day-to-day -day life, they will act like the Greeks, which means they will think in Greek ways. They will endorse sin. They will slam and attack Christianity. They will mock the truth, which is exactly what we are seeing in the UK and the West this very evening. See, our society is changing and we are on a brink of civilizational collapse. We cannot continue our civilization, which has been built upon Christianity, by casting off that foundation. The moment you remove the foundation, it's only a matter of time before the society will collapse. But our society today has forsaken the foundations. They have built upon a new foundation, a foundation that offers no hope. They have built upon a pagan worldview. And I must say, I think in many ways, the church is to blame for this occurring. In many ways, I think the church has ceased to be a light in the darkness and we have compromised the issue of biblical authority. We don't see we don't see the first half of our Bibles being vital. But Genesis and the Old Testament all builds and lays the foundations pointing towards why we need the Savior. And then once we have the foundations laid, the cross makes perfect sense. It gives us a biblical worldview on how to think and how to act. But the church for so long has ignored that. And instead, what we have done is we have sent the world, our children to the world and allowed Greek thinkers to capture generations of our children, to give them a Greek understanding and a Greek education and a Greek worldview. And as a result, by the church sitting passively by, we now have generations of young people who think that Christianity is stupid. We have Greek television, we have Greek internet, we have Greek books and magazines. Worldview is constantly bombarding our children and our culture. But we've sat silently by. When we now proclaim a message of repent, a message that says, turn from your sins and believe in Christ, our society says, what foolishness. What foolishness. But see, what we are doing is even though we have a Greek culture, a pagan culture, we are still trying to evangelize and reach people as if they were Jews. We aren't changing our methods. We aren't understanding where we are coming from. Now, the gospel does not change. But what I'm saying is this, we need to lay the foundations of the gospel. We need to work at turning Greeks into Jews a radical shift in our evangelistic focus. We need to teach people from the very first verse of the Bible. And the only way we can turn Greeks into Jews is if we lovingly and patiently teach the Bible. We must explain the whole counsel of God. We must be ready to answer the questions that people have. In 1 Peter 3.15, it says, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense and answer to everyone who asks for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. But so often we haven't done that. We haven't given answers. Instead, we've simply proclaimed a message that was built more for a Jewish audience, when what we should be doing is proclaiming a message that lays the foundations, that clears away the secularism, that pushes away the pagan foundations and replaces it with a biblical worldview. You see, people around us think differently. They speak differently. They don't understand what we're talking about when it comes to gospel things. So we need to engage in the work of clearing away the objections so the gospel can be understood. See, what we need to do is commit to being Christians 
who will share the gospel with the lost. Now, to do that, we need to do the hard work of laying again the foundations, of teaching our society the truth, of explaining to them who God is and why the world is here and what has gone wrong. And by laying the foundations, by engaging in that hard labor, the good news of Jesus dying and rising again will make much more sense to the world. As we finish, let me just conclude by trying to offer a little bit of encouragement. I know when we sit back and we look at our society and we look at our culture, we see a great darkness. We see paganism is great. And we can perhaps sit back and go, how are we meant to do anything about that? We, we can't change that. Think about the book of Acts again. When the gospel went into the Roman world, it had no Christian worldview. It had no foundation. But over time, the foundation was changed and the gospel flourished. Western civilization is a testimony to that fact. Christianity is in the business of changing mindsets. It's in the business of changing cultures. It's in the business of changing worldviews because Christianity is in the business of proclaiming Christ who can change hearts. And the hope we have is this, that the gospel that turned the world upside down in the first century is the same gospel we proclaim today. So let's be optimistic enough that once again, if we be faithful in establishing new foundations, establishing the truth of who God is, that our God will answer and he'll transform our nation once again. Let's finish with a word of prayer. And then I believe there's uh, some questions and that may have come up. So let's pray together and seek the Lord that he indeed would transform our society. Let's pray. Oh, our God and our Father, we do thank you that you are the God who is the missionary God who seeks and saves the lost. That you, Lord, are still the You are the God who transformed cultures and societies, pagan lands previously. And we look to you, Lord, and we ask that you do it again. Father, please help us to follow the commands of Jesus to go and teach the nations all things. May we faithfully proclaim who you are and what you have done. May we proclaim the whole truth starting from the very first verse. And may you bless our efforts and may you bring many to your kingdom. Lord, tonight we look at the West and we look at our own country and we see the darkness is great. But Father, we hold on to the hope that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Oh Lord, we look to you for your answer and we look to you to move in such a way that we bring glory and honor to your name. We pray these things for Jesus' sake. Amen. Simon, over to you. Thanks, Josh. Can you stop sharing your slides? Excellent. Thanks so much for that. Very encouraging and helpful um, to understand how we should be preaching Christ in this culture. Um, for those that are watching and the many watching on Facebook and in the webinar, we just ask if you have a question, if you want to put it quickly into the Q&A section, and then we'll try and get to it. Someone's asked a question already, Josh Sunita has said, can you recommend any resources that I can give to the teenagers in my family that I'm trying to reach? They don't believe in God, sadly. Now, you don't have to recommend AIG, but if you can think of any that are helpful, any of your own that you've read, or that would might be a help. No, I, I think um, Answers in Genesis actually provides a lot of the good foundational material that would help greatly in this regard. Um, perhaps some of the books on regards to answers for teens that can provide a good foundation there. Um, booklets even that would uh, be very helpful. Uh, I must admit, I haven't kept up with the amount of material that AIG produces. So I'm not sure of some of the latest material, uh, but the answers for teenagers, the answers books, uh, those are the sort of things that are good. Uh, if you can encourage them to read that, that's wonderful. But if they won't read it, then I would encourage you to read those books and then you engage them in conversation and try and answer their questions. I mean, don't just rely on the printed page to reach these people. Take the initiative yourself. Uh, learn how to give answers and then go and evangelize your loved ones with the gospel. Yeah, there is a new book that came out maybe a few months ago. Now, uh, Neil can share this to Anita, if you Neil. Um, quick answers to tough questions and that would be helpful.
for you if these um, teenagers in your family are, are not believers and they don't believe in God, obviously that, that would help them, I think. Um, Josh, uh, another question. Um, sh it, do you think that open air evangelism is successful in, in, in this culture? Many people seem to say, well, it, it, it puts people off, it's, it's not helpful. But should we as a church be going out into the, to the streets uh, and preaching publicly? Well, I'd point out that open air evangelism is never uh, widely accepted in our culture and our society. And, and there's a reason for that, because the open air preacher, when he goes into the public domain, is turning on the light in the darkness. And, and the Lord Jesus himself said in John chapter three, that the darkness hates the light and won't come to the light lest their deeds be exposed. So open air evangelism is never going to be the most popular form of outreach in our society. That being said, is it successful? Well, I think what we need to do is define what is success in evangelism. Uh, is it success to have people sign a decision card and say a sinner's prayer? Maybe, but I don't think that's necessarily successful. I, I would point out that every single person I preach the gospel to makes a decision in regards to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some decide for him, some decide against him. So there's decisions being made left, right, and center. What we have to define successful evangelism as is the question, was Christ proclaimed? Did you proclaim the good news of salvation? See, the gospel is summarized in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. I actually uh, wrote a blog on this the other day on my website, just a summary of what the gospel is. It's the only place in the entire, the scripture says, preach the gospel and here's what the gospel is. And in that gospel presentation, we are told that we have to proclaim what sin is. We have to proclaim that Christ died and that he rose again from the dead. And if you proclaim that message, it is successful evangelism. Now, ultimately, if we base our success understanding on who responds or doesn't respond, then we're assuming a position of God. Ultimately, we can't make anyone respond to the gospel. We are called to proclaim the gospel. We're called to preach the gospel. But it's God who makes the gospel apply to the hearts of the people and saves them. As Jesus said in John chapter 6, no man can come to the Son unless the Father draws him. We are told that faith and repentance are gifts from God. So God is the one that has to save. We're just called to proclaim. And successful evangelism is proclaiming the gospel and leaving the results up to God. Right. Yvonne um, has asked, where will we be able to see this again? Yvonne, if you go to the Answers in Genesis uh, Facebook page, UK Facebook page, not the American one, the UK Facebook page, um, then you'll be able to see this talk. We, we put it there live tonight. And if you go there, please do um, not only watch it again, but share it with others so they can hear um, this message. Josh, another question. Um, how can, you know, if there's a pastor in a church and they're not comfortable, they've never done this before, how, how do they get involved with going out into the streets? How could a pastor encourage his church to get the, their fellowship involved in street evangelism? I think one thing we need to keep in mind is that not all people are gifted and suited for street evangelism. Um, I don't believe there's one size fits all when it comes to outreach. Mm -hmm. yeah, but some people just can't do it. Uh, for instance, I love open air evangelism. I love standing out and talking to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. My wife, on the other hand, that's not her thing. She can evangelize in ways that I can't. Uh, so we have to understand that God gives different people different giftings and different abilities. Now, if someone wanted to learn how to engage in street evangelism or actually just evangelism in general, then I would recommend uh, looking into the material from Ray Comfort, such as the Way of the Master basic training course. Uh, God willing, we're planning to use that at our church here in New Key in the new year, but who knows what the lockdowns are going to do in regards to that sort of training. Uh, but that's a, a simple system that's designed to teach you how to share the gospel, not just on the streets, but in your day-to-day -day lives. Now, one of the things that helps with street evangelism is that that method shows a lot of real life examples from the streets. And by watching it occur on the streets, you start to realize that you too can do that. So if you're looking to encourage people to street evangelism, look at that training material. But also one of the best ways to motivate, motivate people into street outreach or open air outreach is to do it yourself. Just to go out and evangelize and then share what's been happening. Ask people for prayer. Uh, something I do on my own personal ministry page is I'll often write an evangelism report 
and I'm not writing those reports on my Facebook page or my ministry page so people pat me on the back and say, oh, well done, Josh, you know, look what you've done. No, I'm doing that because I know how encouraging it was to me to read what other people were doing. And that encouraged me to go out and evangelize. So tell people what you're doing. Say, hey, I'm going out witnessing. Can you pray for me? If you go out and hand out some gospel tracts, when you come back and say, hey, we handed out 20, 30 tracts, will you join me in praying for the people that received them? If you witness to someone, say, hey, can you pray for Bruce or Bob or Terry, whoever you witness to, let's pray for that person. Because that encourages and stirs people up for ministry. And then if you get someone who's interested, say, do you want to come with me? And if they do come out, don't automatically drop them into it and say, ha, now you've got to do it. I remember when I was learning to open air preach, I was in Christchurch in New Zealand, in Cathedral Square, and a, a brother from the States was preaching. And he had a big crowd and he wanted me to open air preach. And I was like, I'm not interested. <laughs> this is not my thing. I would have been probably at 19 at the time, or probably 18, 19. And uh, he got up and he preached on sin and judgment. He explained who God is. He explained the Ten Commandments, the wrath of God. And the crowd was listening. I was listening. And then he says, and there's good news. And my brother Josh is now going to explain it to you. And then he jumped down off the soapbox that he was on. And I'm there going, yeah, brother, jo hang on, that's me. And he forced me into it. So I wouldn't recommend that tactic. But what you can do is take people out with you. And when they're on the streets with you, say, hey, let's, let's try and hand out a few tracks together. And if you do use the way of the master basic training course, uh, the homework in that training does help you get used to speaking to strangers. So again, I'd recommend the way of the master basic training course, share with people what you're doing, and then encourage them to come out with you if they want to. Great. Uh, someone's asked, Josh, how do you approach preaching the gospel to the multitude of pagan churches in this age that simply don't preach the true gospel and hold to false teachings slash doctrines, whilst maintaining the label of Christian and misleading so many souls, i.e., how do we call this out in practical terms to help propagate the true gospel message by distinguishing false church messages? I think the best way to flush out error is to speak the truth. I mean, so often we can see people get so focused on having discernment ministries, they spend all their time pointing out the error, they forget to proclaim the truth. Uh, but we have to proclaim the truth of the gospel. And by proclaiming the truth of the gospel, people will see error. And that's why it's important to use the Bible. Open up God's word and let the Bible do the heavy lifting. If you can expose people to the word of God, that is a big step forward. Now, something I'll often do when I go out evangelizing is in my pocket, I'll have a track uh, written by an evangelist called Mike Gendron. He's from the US and it's on true and false repentance. And if I meet someone who says, oh, I'm a Christian and you know full well they're not a Christian. I will often give them the track and say, well, let me encourage you. So here's a little Christian leaflet designed for Christians uh, that you might want to read and do a bit of Bible study with. And, and most people say, oh, that's wonderful. I've been thinking about doing a bit more Bible study. And they'll take that little leaflet on true and false repentance. And I hope that they will listen. I read that booklet and they would become true and saving faith. Um, J.C. Ryle, um, the Bishop of Liverpool, had the exact same problem in his day and age. And that's why he wrote a little booklet on are you truly born again? It's, it's always been a problem. But the answer to, to dealing with error is to give them the truth. And you might be able to give good CDs or DVDs that, that shape them and explain the true gospel. Uh, in some cases, it's definitely wise to speak against the heresy, very wise to do that. But I think we need to be very careful in doing that because sometimes you can damage people in your zeal and being unintentional. Uh, we've got to understand where people are at and we have to minister to them where they're at without compromising. So we need to be careful in how we do things. So if someone's obsessed with a, a teacher that you know is false, it may not always be the best tactic to do a full-on frontal direct assault on that teacher because they'll instantly have that emotional attachment and say, well, how dare you attack the man of God? It'd be much better to say, well, brother, let's study the Bible together. Let, let's work at the scripture together. Mm. A few different things or, or listen to this sermon or that sermon and ask people what they think. And as truth comes in, error gets flushed out. And bear in mind, if someone is truly a child of God, Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice. So give them the truth. And if they're truly converted, the Holy Spirit's going to make sure they hear the voice of Jesus and they're going to come out of error but just give them the truth and gently and lovingly at times address error, but be wise in how you do it. We don't have to use a big stick approach all the time. There's a time and place for using the big stick, but sometimes the average person you meet 
doesn't need that approach. They might need just a gentle direction and guidance into the truth. Now, if you encounter the false teacher, I think that's more of an opportunity to use the stick. And there's a time for rebuking and calling out heretics uh, for who they are and what they do. But I think we need to be a bit more gentle with those who have been deceived by them. Yeah. Josh, what about, you spoke about judgment tonight in, in your talk. How do we get that balance right between speaking on judgment and speaking on a lot of love of God? Because a lot of people tend to focus on the love of God and say, well, don't put too much emphasis on judgment because that will put people off. So how do you go about um, getting the balance right? It's very hard to get a balance right, to be honest. Uh, Martin Luther once said that the church is much like a drunk man in that he tries to climb on a horse and he's falling off one side to another. And that's um, quite a common way we deal with things. We see the error of, of love, love, and we kick back too far and go judgment, 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 judgment. But we need to hit a balance. And, and that's really struck me as I'm going through the book of Nahum is that even though Nahum chapter one, I'd encourage people to read Nahum chapter one. It is a hard and heavy chapter. God's saying, you're vile. I'm going to bury you in the grave. I'm going to wipe you out. You, you don't see those verses cross-stitched on a pillow at a Christian bookshop. You're not going to get those wall posters. But God's using all that language. But something that struck me is that in the midst of all this judgment language, God is still talking about, I'm slow to anger. I'm gracious. Trust in me. Those who trust in me will not be destroyed. Uh, how good, uh, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And God hits this balance. And I think we need to be balanced like that. We proclaim the love of God, but the love of God also shows that God is holy and he will judge wickedness. And as we proclaim the judgment of God, we also proclaim the love of God, that God judges wickedness, but he shows love towards sinners and he calls on them to come to him. So we need to work carefully at not going to one extreme to another. And I can't say I've always got it right. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, would, I would challenge anyone to say you've always got it right. Uh, because there are times that we focus too much one way or the other. But we must strive to be balanced in our presentation of who God is and what he requires. Thanks, Josh. That was a good answer. Um, I can't see any more questions coming through, folks. So unless you've got one, you'll have to do it really quickly. But I just thank Josh for your time tonight. It's been very helpful. I know a lot of people are thankful in the comment sections and on Facebook. Um, do you just want to tell people if they want to reach you or if, you can, if they want to look into the sermon series you're doing on Nahum, where should they go? Probably the easiest way is to go to my website directly, joshwilliamson.org. Uh, and from my website, you can get in touch with me. You can read the blog. I'm trying to get a regular a blog up each week on different evangelistic topics and subjects. Uh, and you can also find links then to my sermons. Uh, you could also contact us through our New Key Baptist website. And uh, through one of those sites, you will, you'll get in touch with me. But for evangelism-focused things, probably my website's probably easier, uh, joshwilliamson.org. And you're on, have you got a ministry page on Facebook if people are watching there? Yeah, if you jump on Facebook and search my name, you will see my ministry page. I think it's facebook.com forward slash Josh Williamson Evangelist or something like that. Um, but you can find that through my web page or just by putting in the search bar. Um, it'd be great to connect with you. And if people have any questions, feel free to email or send me a message. Uh, I believe one of the roles of the evangelist is to help equip and encourage the saints to the work of the ministry. So I want to do that where I can. And if I can encourage you in some way, then let us rejoice in the Savior together that together we can reach this nation for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Great. And thanks, guys, for, for watching tonight. Just to remind you, the next webinar we have coming up isn't till December the 5th, which is a, actually a day conference. It's um, a, a conference on the Bible. And so we're going to look at a number of different subjects. We've got seven different speakers. We're going to touch on Sola Scriptura, scientific evidence for the Bible, archaeological evidence for the Bible, the inerrancy of Scripture, the resurrection. How do we know the Bible is the word of God? Lots of different topics being covered. So if you're interested in that, you can go to answersingenesis.org and you will see on the UK page um, the link to that conference. Or you can go to our UK Facebook page and go to the event section and you'll see the conference there. That's just £5 for that day conference. So I would recommend you signing up for that um, if, you're, if you're interested in those subjects. But Josh, thanks again for, listen, uh, for being with us tonight and doing the presentation. Thank you very much for having me. And thanks, guys, for watching and being with us. I'm going to switch off the webinar now. So when, when I do that, we're all going to go and we won't see each other again, uh, at least not tonight. <laughs>
So again, Josh, thanks. And thank you everyone for watching. Have a good and great weekend. God bless. Thanks, Josh. Thank you.